Hello and welcome to Unstress, the summer series for 2021. What a year 2020 has been, and we have curated some episodes which we think were particularly relevant to what has been going on. I hope you're having a great break. Looking forward to the new year and catching up then. Until then, hope you enjoy this episode. Hello and welcome to Unstress. I'm Dr. Ron Ehrlich. I continue to be fascinated by this world we live in and what holistic really means. My guest today is Terry McCosker. Now, Terry is an internationally acclaimed teacher and has worked in research and property management, now that's agricultural properties, in both government and private sectors for over 45 years. Now, in his research era, Terry published over 40 papers and made several world-first discoveries in the 1980s in the fields of ruminant nutrition and fertility, as well as a deep understanding of pasture ecology. And he shares some pretty amazing facts with us today. Terry's ideas took farming out of a war against nature to an association with it. It's not just a lesson for farmers, it's a lesson for us all. He introduced Australian farmers to the concept of ecosystem health and developed methods of measuring it alongside financial health. Rather importantly, he introduced the concept of farm family well-being and welcomed female partners, siblings and parents into courses about decision-making. Again, it's probably lessons not just for those on the land, but for us all as well. I hope you enjoy this conversation I had with Terry McCosker. Welcome to the show, Terry. Good. Thank you, Ron. Good to be here. Thanks, Terry. Listen, uh, Resource Consulting Services, RCS, how did you get started? Tell us a bit about it. Well, I think it came about because I jumped the fence in my earlier career. and I'd been with... Uh, Queensland Department of Primary Industries for 11 years as a scientist and an advisor. And then I went on to a property to implement everything that I thought I knew. And within six months, I realised that I actually knew nothing that worked and fitted into a system. And pretty soon after that, I decided that one day I would set up a private extension service Um, which operated differently to the public extension services. Um, I had no idea how to do it. Um, I had no idea when I would do it. And uh, it was probably 10 years or more after that that I started RCS. And then it took me another five years after that to work out how to uh, to put together and grow a private extension service that operated differently to the public extension services. Mm -hmm. So that's a sort of a, a potted history of how we got started. Uh, so, and so you had spent considerable number of years in Queensland Primary Industry Department advising farmers. Yes, so uh, my history goes back a fair way. I actually joined the Queensland Department of Primary Industries as a cadet in 1967. Um, so I've been operating professionally in agriculture now for uh, a little over 50 years. <laughs> God damn uh, yeah. Sobering, <laughs> and, isn't it? Sobering. Yeah. Well, it is, yeah. Um, yeah. And and in that, I've had all sorts of different experiences. in um, So in the government sector, uh, then uh, on a property for seven years, uh, trying to implement what I thought I knew uh, and figuring out that I didn't actually know enough to make it work. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was a sobering experience. Mm. Uh, and then uh, having a go at operating a consulting business uh, for a number of years, um, and that wasn't terribly successful. Uh, and then I, I really stumbled on, in a way, uh, holism. And um, I had learned while I was on the station to – I learned a lot about systems thinking and pulling things together and pulling all sorts of threads together. And I was in a, in a wonderful position there. I was basically, as a young kid, really, only about 28, I was given this property um, – and uh, all the resources I needed to solve all the problems in the beef industry in Northern Australia. And uh, and we went ahead and did that within the context of a cattle property. And I, I employed experts and consultants from all around the world. Uh, and But what I learned to do was actually take what was going to work and put that into a system 
So over time, I developed some skills around being able to do that. But I hadn't really come across the, the terminology of holism until uh, to really the late 1980s. And uh, that sort of started me down a, a different journey then from the, from the early 1990s, um, where we started to then take RCS into an organisation which operated holistically um, and looked at uh, how we could get uh, farming families to operate holistically as well. And so that was really when I started to work out how to, how to put together a private extension service that was going to work. Mm. And this word holistic, uh, you know, I know what it conjures up in the medical world. I can only imagine what it must conjure up in the world of agriculture. How was it? How is the word holistic? I mean, this was in the 1980s. How is the word holism received in 2019? With incredible opposition. Um, <laughs> it's a bizarre, isn't it? It's actually it, quite bizarre. But anyway, go on. It is bizarre. And um, but I think when you come in with completely new concepts of running agriculture, for example, which is what it was, um, what that does is threaten everybody who's been doing it in within the old paradigms or the existing paradigms for their entire life. And it particularly threatens the careers of the scientists uh, involved. And I had unbelievable opposition from my old uh, organisation, Queensland Department of Primary Industries, CSIRO, every Department of Primary Agri of Agriculture in Australia had incredible opposition. And um, I was actually told in Queensland that they would put me out of business for, for such heresy, and they tried and very nearly succeeded. Um, but uh, I overcame that by where I focused, and um, so I had to work out Firstly, who was right and who was wrong? But were were this incredible opposition? Were they right, or were the one person I was listening to was he right? And um, so I was very fortunate to get a Churchill Fellowship, and I went around the world and I studied a, a process called cell grazing, which is based around holistic management. And uh, and I realised in that process that. Um, the one person I was listening to was right and everybody else was <laughs> stuck within an old paradigm. Do you want to put a name to that person? Yeah, Dr. Stan Parsons. Stan Parsons. Uh, yes, I've yeah. heard that name before. Mm. Is he based in Australia? Was he? No, he's a Zimbabwean. He was a partner of Alan Sabres mm -hmm. for, yes, for well. 13 years. Mm -hmm. And the world actually owes Parsons and Savory a, a, a debt of gratitude because it was their combined intellects that put together the concept of holism in agriculture. Um, and in fact, it was Stan who, um, who introduced Alan, Alan Savory to, to holism. Um, and Stan had uh, Jan Smuts's book, which was published, I think, in the mm -hmm. 1930s, um, which was the first book on holism. And Stan had read that and then he thought, well, we really need to start taking up this kind of philosophy in agriculture. And and that, the combined intellects of Savory and Parson was, was unbelievable and neither of them um, produced as much on their own again um, after that as they did when they were a combined force. Mm. It's interesting, uh, Terry, to hear you say you em embracing this concept of um, holism in the 1980s because in my own practice in the city of Sydney, I embraced this concept of holistic dentistry and received similar pushback. And I've heard you say that agriculture and medicine are very similar in that their main focus is on treating symptoms, not causes. What are some examples of symptomatic issues agriculture faces? I think the biggest one is weeds, for example, is a classic um, symptom treating exercise. Uh, and there's an old saying that says, while well, ever you um, treat weeds, there'll be weeds for you to spray. Mm -hmm. And weeds, diseases in crops and so on are, are symptom treating. And what I teach people is the opposite, and that is focus on what you want, not on what you don't want. And if we keep focusing on weeds, we keep getting them because we keep treating a symptom and therefore the cause is never treated and the symptom just keeps coming back. Now, whether it's a weed or whether it's a disease in plants and soils, etc., cetera, um, it's exactly the same process. Uh, and by trying to nuke 
plants with the chemicals that are available to us today, we're actually then doing further damage, which um, encourages other weeds and diseases. Um, so when I'm working with people, I say, look, focus on what you want, not on what you don't want. So if you want grass there instead of weeds, then focus on managing grass. Focus on managing the soil and the ecosystem so that you get the outcome that you want. And eventually that plant, which you're calling a weed, which is in fact serving an ecological function, Mother Nature has put it there for a very good reason. Um, let's go with that, right? And it, its journey will end sometime with the next one year to two years to three years and you will end up with what you want if you focus on what you want. Um, and I suspect there's a you know fairly similar sort of thing goes on you know in medicine in, the, in that absolutely you, you, you get hit with the antibiotic for example mm. which then destroys your microbiome which then um, you know causes a whole lot of other other issues. Yeah. So, no, no, I, I love that uh, that statement. I might actually print it up in my surgery. Focus on what you want, not what you don't want. Because that is exactly what people do focus on. You know, you come in with an inflammation, you get an anti-inflammatory. You come in with a depress depression, you get an antidepressant and so on. And I guess in on the farm, you, you focus on the weed and you'll get a pesticide or a herbicide or, uh, you know, whatever a side you're trying to kill. Absolutely. Mm. Uh, and there's plenty of those available and there's a lot of companies that are willing to supply you with many of those as you're, you're willing to buy. Mm. Yes, it's a great economic model, isn't it? Oh. Just, just not a very good health model. It's a common theme. Listen, another thing that I I, I wanted to ask you about because it's a message we get, we increasingly hear about in news and media about public health, climate change, and the environment, and animal animal agriculture. You know, the the use of animals and the consumption of meat is often raised as a big part of this problem. How how do you respond to that? Um, I think there's two two sides to a, to any coin, really. And the, the first one is that depends on what part of the livestock food chain you look at as to whether it's a problem or a solution. Grazing ruminants are a solution to climate change, to human health, to a whole lot of things. Um, Feedlotted animals and uh, you know intensive animal management. Uh, in housing, etc., is either is not good for the animal and generally not good for the environment. Um, and Wendell Berry summed it up beautifully many years ago when he when he talked about the feedlot industry and he said we've taken an elegant solution, which is grazing animals on grass, <laughs> and turned it into two separate problems, which is the issues that we we get out of a feedlot. And there's actually more than two when you start adding them up. So. Grazing livestock were evolved as recyclers, and a ruminant animal recycles about 85% of what it actually eats. So that that um, all that plant material is cycled back onto the ground in dung and urine, which is then plant available. And in fact, urine from a ruminant is such a beautiful thing that it contains plant growth hormones that stimulate the very grasses that the animal is then going to come back and eat. Wow. Um, and, and Mother Nature works in incredible ways. So those, those animals then that are eating grass and, and, and free range in a way um, is they have the right balance of nutrients. So their omega-3 to omega-6 uh, fatty acid ratio um, is more in balance with our traditional diet. When we start feeding grain to ruminants, which were never designed to eat grain, in fact, it it makes the rumen go acid, and, and uh, while they can't eat it, you've got to transition them onto that, um, and then there's a whole lot of side effects. And it's it's you know, making a ruminant eat grain is like making a human eat sugar. Um, there is very again similar a lot of parallels in the impact on uh, on, on animal health and human health. So, if but if we put those animals on what they were designed to eat, which is forage, uh, then we end up with uh, with a really tight omega three omega six ratio, um, and we end up with the the good um, uh, fatty acids, for example, uh, from that animal. And a lot of the data that's around on um, 
food quality from meat uh, is actually from the U.S. feedlot industry. And, mm. But you get a totally different view of the quality of meat and its health benefits if you're actually looking at um, grass-fed beef, for example. Uh, and I remember uh, my daughter Stacy, when she was studying to be a naturopath, she did an assignment once on uh, on the quality of beef and she came to me and she said, Dad, beef is really bad for you. And I said to her, I'll, I want you to go back and look at that literature that you've just reviewed and I will bet you that every bit of it is based on a feedlot animal. Mm -hmm. I'd like you to go and find grass-fed data and compare the two. And so she did and she came back and said, Dad, beef is better than fish if it's grass-fed. And I, I, think, I think a lot of people don't understand that. Mm. But the beef that the majority of people are eating is, in fact, um, grain-fed, even yeah. if it's only for a short period. Yeah, I was at a conference recently where uh, a professor of nutrition got up and, and was talking about how bad red meat was. And my question to him was, was there a difference between grain-fed and grass-fed? And he had to admit there was, but only unquestioning. You know, he yeah. kind of made the statement that, kind of people were writing notes, you know, red meat, bad, you know, yep, yep. terrible, um, but asked the question, is there a difference? And he said, uh, yeah, there is. Um, yeah, I suppose there is. And I'm just loving that plant growth hormone in the urine. Wow, that I just didn't know. That's uh, that's a beautiful, makes the system even more beautiful than I thought it was. Well, I'll give you another example of how beautiful it is. There is a bacteria that lives in the soil and on plant leaf um, called Streptococcus um syringii and streptococcus syringii is a bacteria that then floats off into the atmosphere and it's got a particular structure that attracts water and so it goes up into the cloud and it is what forms rain within clouds oh my God. and then those bacteria fall back to earth again back onto the plants go through a life cycle and go back to the atmosphere so if we have bare ground for example um, we don't have those bacteria going up into the atmosphere, into the clouds, and forming raindrops. Uh, so, wow. uh, and they are far more powerful than the other elements that form raindrops. God, that's, well, this is holism, isn't it? Really, I mean. Uh... It's fascinating. Uh, I, I mean, I love it. I love the fact that you just keep on learning. But I guess people's resistance to it is we also love certainty, you know, and we love to know the answer. And a simple answer is one we we move to much more readily. So that, that just adds so many components to it. Um, and I'm sure there are many, many others as well. Yeah. I mean, that guy you were listening to was a scientist, but he had politicised his science. And I think that's a real danger that we're running into today. So he's letting his um, paradigms about what should be right drive what he's actually telling people hmm. out of the science. So he's selecting what uh, he wanted to tell people. And, and I think we see a lot of that in climate as well as uh, as well as everywhere else. Hmm. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, another interesting thing is that, you know, managing resources, and we've been focused on regenerative agriculture on this show on several of our episodes. It seems often to focus on how animals are managed. But I also heard you say, see, I've been doing my homework, Terry. I also heard you say not that long ago that RCS, your, your company, is now addressing some of the issues of cropping. Um, what are the challenges of cropping from a regenerative perspective? Yeah, if I can give you a little backstory to that. So mm. we've been involved with, with holism in terms of grazing uh, and regenerative agriculture you know, since the late 80s in the grazing industry. And we did ne not go anywhere near cropping until very recently because I did not have a set of principles that I believed were regenerative or sustainable into the long a long view. I, I take the view that we need to be able to do what we're doing today in 5,000 years' time. And if we can't, then what we're doing is not sustainable. And a lot of what we do today is, is going to flood out last 50 years or 100 years, let alone 5,000. So in the last few years, there's been um, some breakthroughs around biology and a whole range of things in our understanding of how soils operate. And when I did soil science close to 50 years ago, 
we learned about chemistry and we learned about physics. And even up until probably the last five years and 10 years, I, I know people that are graduating that are still only learning about chemistry and physics. But the third element of soil is biology. And what we know now is that biology actually controls chemistry and physics. So as a human, if we think that we can get out there and manipulate our environment through chemistry and physics, um, we're sadly mistaken because what we're doing often in the process is destroying the biology, which was actually going to do the job for us. Mm -hmm. um, and so over the time that I've been working with graziers, a lot of people think that they were their graziers or livestock managers. By the time they do the first round with us, they realise that they're in fact grass managers. Um, but by the time they learn a little bit more about ecology and, and um, soils, etc., they realise they're in fact soil managers. Mm -hmm. And that management of that soil then creates all the wealth that happens from then on. Yeah. Um, and in terms of cropping, what we've put together is a set of principles now that I think um, we can turn around the way cropping systems are done. And that doesn't matter whether we're talking wheat or sugar or, or horticulture, the same principles actually apply. Um, you know, and the first of those is, is really about management. Um, and one of the things that I've learned now being involved for a very long time is that the, the outcomes that we get in our ecosystem and in our systems and our production systems, et cetera, are due to management. Um, the, the current drought is a classic example. Um, a lot of what we're seeing and hearing in the media, et cetera, is in fact man-made. Uh, and it's not, it's partly due to lack of rainfall, but we've degraded our soils to such an extent that when we do get rain, it doesn't go in. Mm. Um, so we've, we've got a massive man made issue now to deal with. Um, so it comes down to management. Um, it, we've got to maximise photosynthesis because the soil principles are, in fact, about looking after biology. Um, and the first principle is a little bit like the first principle of medicine, first do no harm, uh, because so much of what we do in agriculture actually does harm to biology. Um, so we're looking at, at, at how we do no harm, um, and we understand that biology is the driver of the system, um, not an outcome or an incidental thing that just happens to be there. Uh, and if we focus on it and we help it, then it will actually do unbelievable jobs for us. Um, we need biodiversity in our systems, and in, this is probably one of the biggest issues in cropping systems where we go you know, wheat year on year on year or wheat interspersed with barley or oats or something like that, but no real biodiversity into that plant and soil system uh, is a real issue. Uh, and surprisingly, the, the, one of the key principles around soil health is actually livestock. Um, livestock must be involved um, and there's several reasons again one of those is the fact that they're a recycler uh, the second is they are um, biological taxis so on their hooves and on their mouths and so on they're carrying around biology from one part of the paddock to another if you if you think about a bacterium for example it can't get up and move it has to have something that transports it um, and livestock actually um, fulfil that function as well. So those are the sorts of things. Um, and just to give you an example of um, of some of the of doing no harm, one of the things that is commonly used through, in agriculture throughout the world are salt-based um, phosphate fertilisers, so monoammonium phosphate, diammonium phosphate, single superphosphates, etc. And we put those on. Um, but they will kill between 30 and 70% of the mycorrhizal fungi that was going to feed the plant phosphorus. <laughs> and, you know, you can see how when we start treating symptoms um, and we leave nature out of the equation, uh, we have to do all the heavy lifting because nature just pulls back and says, well, you think you're smart enough, away you go. Um, and so it's very easy to, to select forms of phosphorus to use in agriculture that are not harmful to biology. Um, so that's the sort of thinking that um, you know that we're bringing into the the, uh, the cropping space now. How does that translate to a wheat? Say say you were going up to consult 
to a wheat farmer and, you know, here he is year in, year out, I mean, alternating two crops maybe, I guess. Um, mm. how, how, does, how, does that, how do you go about changing that pattern on a massive scale? Like I had a, I had a patient in a few weeks ago who has 25,000 acres up in northern New South Wales, wheat farmer. And, and that would be quite a challenge, wouldn't it, to translate that into the big production? It is, but so the, what you've got to look at is a transition process from industrial or chemical-based agriculture into more biological-based agriculture. Now, the, what we do know is that the biology is incredibly resilient and we can bring it back very, very quickly if we just stop harming it. So the, there's probably three or four really harmful things that we, we're doing. The first one is that, that phosphorus. The second one is nitrogen and using excessive amounts of nitrogen. We know, for example, that when you're putting on things like urea, there's only about 30% of it actually gets to the, to the plant system. The rest of it either volatilizes to the atmosphere or is lost, or lost uh, through the soil profile. Um, and we can change that very, very quickly by adding organic compounds in with urea and spraying it on in small quantities uh, onto the leaf. So the plant takes it in in a form where it convert it, can convert it into amino acids because it's got the nitrogen and the carbon in, immediately there, almost bound together, if you like, in the, in the foliar application. Uh, so the, there's simple things like that that we can do and just start doing those all together. Mm. So um, change your type of phosphorus, reduce the amount of nitrogen, start putting it on in a different way, start putting humic acids and fulvic acids into your system. If you must use weedicides, and most cropping systems still will have to use weedicides, but um, then mix those weedicides uh, with fulvic acid and reduce the amount of um, we decide by 30% straight up mm. and make it because you can make it more effective by mixing it with a humic, you know, or a, a, a humic compound like that. Um, and so we're doing less harm. Mm. Uh, putting biology in when we plant a crop, um, for example, using uh, compost extract. So we're only using the equivalent of about two to three kilograms of compost per hectare. But, we've ex but we extract the biology from that. Um, and so that's very, very cheap. You can actually make your own compost, put it out, and it's costing you cents per hectare to put on a very broad spectrum biology in while you're planting a crop. Um, the, it, you know, so there's actually so many things we can do to be transitioning. Hmm. And then slowly over a period of time, we start uh, withdrawing the, the harmful things. And what... What you find then is that as a plant is fed properly by the biology, instead of us feeding it artificially or force feeding it with fertilisers, the quality of that plant improves. So the, the BRICS level, which is the um, measure of the complex sugars in the plant, rises. And once the BRICS level gets above 14, plants are resistant to insects and diseases. So... Very, very quickly, within one to two years, um, insecticides and fungicides go right out of the business. There's actually no need for them because the plants become self-protecting. In mm. other words, they have their, their own immune system, which they'll develop when we let the biology do the job. Mm -hmm. I know he was talking about literally thousands of dollars worth of urea sprinkled on, you know, sprayed on the, on the land every year. To, to add to that nitrogen, so it's interesting you you just pick that you know mention that straight off. Um, you know the other I, I was talking to I had the pleasure of talking to uh, well Alan Savory last year and he made the point that uh, soil was the biggest export in the United States every year. You know they lose so much soil that uh, people are actually soil farmers, as you say, not just grass farmers, but actual soil farmers, no matter what they do. That's correct, and and the reason that's happening, and I, I read a figure recently, I think it's something like they export uh, something like five kilos of soil for every kilo of corn that they grow. Um, now, the reason that happens is that the soil biology has been killed, mm. and it's soil biology that holds soil together. And when we take that out of the system, the soil then becomes 
um, very loose. It can be picked up by wind. It can be picked up by rain. Um, and it's very easy to demonstrate with uh, just with a soil infiltration test or a, an aggregation test to show that a, a healthy soil that's got biology in it, you can put it in water and the water below it stays perfectly clean. You can take a soil out of a chemical-based system and put it put it in water and it just disintegrates. It just falls apart. Mm. Um, and so the difference is the biology, and, and all we need to do is make sure that we maintain the biology in the system, get it back into the system and get it doing its job, and all of that soil loss will actually stop. Mm. Um, even recently in the United States, there have been major... Uh, highways uh, closed because of wind erosion and dust going across roads where you can't see anything. Mm -hmm. And and I think you mentioned that uh, the drought, the, a big component of the drought is man-made because of the fact that, um, you know, wind and rain. I mean, just to let our listener know, if a healthy soil, if it rains, a healthy soil should penetrate, the water should penetrate quickly and, and deeply. And, and that's a big difference between an unhealthy soil where it washes away. What's the difference? I mean, you know, in a healthy soil, moisture should get in there quite quickly, shouldn't it? Well, I'll give you some numbers on that. In a, in Thank healthy, you. I was hoping you would. <laughs> yeah. In a healthy pasture, an inch of rain will disappear in 10 seconds. Into the soil. Into the soil in 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. On an unhealthy pasture, um, let's say straight through the fence, but managed differently, um, in a pasture situation, that same inch of rain can take seven minutes to infiltrate. Mm. That's huge. On a, on a crop, and this is one, um, this data I'm quoting is from one crop where pasture had been sprayed out and one crop had been grown on the same soil type, it took 32 minutes for one inch of rain to go into that soil. Wow. So, you know, 10 seconds versus 32 minutes. Mm. And in the, the process, losing a bit of soil as the water runs off. Well, that's correct. It's the moment that water starts to move and you don't have the biology, you don't have the, the aggregation and the porosity in the soil. So it's the biology that aggregates the soil into particles. And when you aggregate, you end up with a lot more air space and a lot more space for water within the soil. As that biology disappears, the glue disappears out of the soil and the soil then becomes compacted so you have less air space and, and less uh, space for water into the soil. Therefore, the water just gets up and goes and takes the soil with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, look, I also, <laughs> I've had the pleasure of talking with Charles Massey, who um, I'm sure you, you know, and, and he yeah. talked about five cycles, and I think I'm going to get these right, the solar cycle, which is your maximised photosynthesis um, the water cycle, which is what we've just been talking about, the soil mineral cycle and diversity, which you've also spoken about. But he mentioned the fifth, and I think possibly the most challenging and arguably the most important is this human social cycle. I hope I got those five cycles right. What, what are some of the challenges when you're dealing with that human social cycle? I mean, I think you've mentioned resistance to change, but what are some of the other challenges in that human social cycle? It is the biggest challenge, and it's it really comes down to our paradigms. It comes back to um, traditional approaches. So tradition is essentially a paradigm, um, and I think what Charlie says is the human mind that oversees all of those other things, and it's the human mind and therefore the management that humans apply to an ecosystem that determines the health of the ecosystem. Um, and having been teaching this stuff now for 30 years, it, the thing that turns farmers on the most is a basic understanding of ecology and the fact that they're actually managing an ecosystem, um, not managing livestock, for example, and not just growing crops. You know, they're not just in agriculture. They're, in fact, managing an ecosystem. And they get turned on by it. They just love it. And as they get that understanding, their whole paradigm shifts in terms of how we go about managing it into the future. Mm -hmm. um, and so the way we operate in, in RCS is, is firstly we have a training event which is aimed at shifting paradigms. Um, goes for seven days. It's very, very intensive and we throw 
far more information at people than they could possibly absorb. Um, but it's not about what information they absorb. It's about busting open paradigms. It's about making people receptive to change. Um, and so that's our beginning process. From then on, you've got knowledge, for example, we really like you uh, as a dentist, you might have some, read some books, you might have seen people do it. But to be a good dentist, you actually have to have the skill to implement the theory and the knowledge that you actually have. And farming is no different. Um, we could teach people all sorts of different ways of doing things, but until those different ways of, of acting are put into practice and become skills, um, the business itself, the farm itself, the soil, the ecosystem, etc., doesn't actually change. And one of the big mistakes I think that, that a lot of organisations have made is, is run out there and do a, you know, a one-day soil course or a two-day teaching them about this, that and the other thing. Um, those exercises are about awareness and that's very important. But um, in my experience, you don't really bring about permanent change until you've shifted paradigms and secondly, that um, you've then developed new skills which replace some old skills. Um, you know, if you ask your audience uh, who wants who wants change, you know, whether it's climate, you know, when how are we managing climate change or whatever, everyone will put their hands up. But if you ask the question who wants to change, <laughs> you'll get a different number of hands up. <laughs> and we're all the same, you know, we all resist change, um, and and we all want to. We're comfortable with our paradigms. And our brain, in fact, um, you know, when we're learning something new, it's it's a high energy activity for our brain. It doesn't like it. It would much prefer we go back into our old habits and and uh, where it can just churn stuff through without uh, us having really to think about it. Um, so I I see that the real issue is firstly, um, how do we uh, create paradigm shifts? Um, because that's effectively what we're wanting to do. We're wanting to bust up tradition, uh, bust up some um, of, of the traditional science, if you like, um, which is which I think has led us down the garden path. Um, and then how do we educate people and then bring about the skills change that are required to make a difference on the ground? Mm. So those are the key issues, I think. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I've been fascinated by change, you know, and managing change, particularly you know, when we're talking about health, uh, people sometimes have to change and, and what, what drives that. And a big part of it is whether you feel you have an, a lo the locus of control is one way of looking at it. And do you feel you have, do you have an internal locus of control, which means you've got some control over what's going on in your life? Or do you have an external locus of control, meaning I'm, I'm a victim of fate, I'm a victim of the climate, I'm a victim of this, I'm a victim of that. And, and I would have, you know, I guess the biggest, one of the biggest challenges is to encourage people to realise that having control over what happens um, is a very empowering thing to do. And, and you, you mentioned management being a very big part of determining outcomes, um, the paradigm shift. It's so interesting to hear you talk about about uh, this managing an ecosystem because I've often said if I had a choice of what I'd go back to study, I'd go back and study anatomy, physiology and biochemistry and see it in the clinical setting of what I see every day in my practice. I'd study it with nutrition and I'd study it with pain. So going back to basics and seeing how the world works in that ecosystem must be a really important part of changing people in, in that paradigm. I think it is, and, and just understanding that it's in fact an ecosystem that we're working with. And the other thing, I, I take an Aboriginal view of the world, and that is that we don't actually own land. We're only custodians of it for a very short period of time. And as a custodian, I think our, um, our obligation is to leave it in better condition than we found it. Uh, and unfortunately, we have... As a, as a human race, we have this uh, develop this attitude that we're above ecosystems, we're mm. above Mother Nature, that we can actually um, smash it into, you know, into the shape that we want it into. Um, 
But my experience is that Mother Nature's got more tricks and more stuff up her sleeve than we will ever understand mm. as, as humans. Um, and I think we have to be much more humble about our role in, in nature and that we have to understand that we are part of it and we are part of the ecosystems. We're a very powerful part, um, and that's the problem. Uh, but we are not above it, and that's that's a paradigm shift that we need to make. And the other thing you you mentioned there is um, in management and control. My definition of management is controlling your destiny. Yeah. And um, and I think we've got to, as individuals, we've all got to take more responsibility for our own outcomes. And again, I think a great weakness in society today is that this whole ethic of self-responsibility seems to have gone out the window and everybody wants somebody else to be responsible for their outcomes. And while we go down that pathway, it, there's, it's not going to have a happy, happy ending. Mm. Now, this is probably a good opportunity to ask you that if you, if you had an opportunity to speak to people in the city and get them involved in a positive way in this human social cycle, this regenerative movement, giving all you know and what you've done professionally for so many years, what would you say to those of us in the city? How can we in the city help this movement? That's a really, really good question and a very difficult one to answer. Um, the first thing I would probably say is look for regenerative food. Um, initially, all you can probably do is, is focus on organic food. But there's a difference between the quality of organic food and food that I would consider to be grown regeneratively. And, and that's that organics has moved away from its original focus, which was actually around soil health and organic carbon in soils. Um, it's moved towards lack of chemicals uh, in, the, in the production of food. Um, the, the problem with that is there is no system, there is no way of you in the city identifying what was grown regeneratively and what wasn't. Um, so there's a major problem there. Um, the other thing that I would dearly love to do is change the message that goes to the city. Agriculture sends the wrong message continuously. Um, the drought is a classic example. And I know people that the media has come onto their place to do an interview with them. And when they've found out that they're actually managing the drought reasonably well, they're comfortable with where they're at, they leave and they go and find somebody that's got a poor bugger me story, um, the doom and gloom story where my animals are dying and I've run out of money and all of that stuff. The media is actually sending the message that's coming from about 5 to 10% of agriculture and portraying that as everybody. And that's a major problem that we've got in agriculture to communicate. Um, I The message I would like to see going to the city is that that we are managing an ecosystem. We are trying to do our best. There are a lot of people out there that are in fact reversing damage that's been done to our ecosystem over the last 150 to 200 years. Um, and there are people working hard to do that. You know, how could that be supported? The, the way in which I would like to see that supported is through carbon credits. For example, the carbon credits for soil carbon. Um, and over the next four or five years, we're going to see those start to come onto the market. Um, if you're buying carbon credits or supporting uh, somebody who is, then what you're doing is um, supporting regenerative agriculture because um, those are the people, the people that are, are able to regenerate carbon in their soils, uh, which is a win-win-win in every direction. So it's a win for the environment. We're taking CO2 out of the atmosphere Probably more importantly, we're taking water vapour out of the atmosphere and storing it. Um, the, the quality of food produced in a soil improves uh, as the amount of carbon in the soil increases. We hold more water, so therefore the farms are more resilient in terms of these, you know, the, these climate changes and extremes that we're getting. Soils are, are warmer in winter and cooler in summer when you've got lots of carbon in the system. Uh, and... And there's an income source there for farmers to encourage them to become regenerative. Um, so I think 
that is one way. And one of the other things that's just starting to be developed now is um, is biodiversity credits as well. So as uh, farmers are increasing the um, biodiversity, the bird populations, the insect populations, the, the soil biology, um, the plant biodiversity on their properties, that all that biodiversity, uh, which they're doing out of their own pockets at the moment, um, there might be an opportunity down the track for people to support that sort of stuff as well. Mm, fantastic. Um, now, listen, we, we covered some territory here, Terry, and I, I just wanted to finish up by asking you, you know, if you were to take your step back as an educator and, and you work at our RCS and we're all on this, this health journey together through life, what do you think the biggest challenge is for people on our health journey through life in our modern world? Again, that's a that's a, a brilliant question, Ron. Um, I, it's actually something I've been reflecting on just recently because I'm in the process of writing up a little bit of stuff from my past, and um, uh, I grew up on a mixed farm um, in a situation where you know we'd milk the cows before we went to school in the morning. We worked with the pigs, we worked with the crops, and we had no water. And we, our entire family, which was seven of us would bath in about two inches of water in the bottom of the bath once a week. Um, and that was the most water we had. What I was reflecting on is that as a result of that, I have an incredibly strong microbiome. And if I was to take your question now and, and answer it on the basis, on the background of that, I would say the first thing is we've got to change the disconnect from nature. Um, I've got a, a, you know, a niece who's got a young child in Melbourne and, and they live in a high rise and, they, uh, and they, they work in a high rise across the road and he goes to daycare in the high rise across the road. So they'll go out of that high rise, they'll cross the bitumen, and they'll get into a lift and they'll go back up into another high rise without any connection whatsoever to nature and the microbiomes that they could and should be picking up. And I shudder to think of the health issues that that child's going to have in another 20 or 30 years because it hasn't had the chance to um, build a, a healthier microbiome. I'd like to see people getting dirty. I think this, um, there's too much emphasis on um, trying to keep things clean and, um, and, and on uh, antiseptics and things like that in our life. Um, that's got to be damaging our microbiome. And I would, I, I think the next one is processed food. Um, I saw a, a thing, uh, I think it was on Facebook uh, a week or so ago, and a scientist in the US had put up the ingredients of three things. Um, two of them were non beef burgers, and one of them was dog food. And he asked people um, to pick which one was which. And when you looked at the ingredients, and there was a list of 10, 12 ingredients in each of those things, and it was impossible to pick which one was the dog food. And that says to me that the further we go down this processed food approach away from eating fresh food, um, growing our own fresh food, for example, um, the, the sicker we're actually going to get as a society. Um, and the final one I would say is that there are major problems in our food chains uh, and a lot of it's to do with being the, that processing. Um, I think the, the dominance of the supermarkets determining what it is we're going to eat uh, is, a, is an issue. And the really big one is how, if I'm sitting in Sydney or Melbourne or Brisbane or big towns or cities anywhere, how do I actually source um, real food from real farmers, um, and I and I can get that connection. Um, that's a real a major issue, and there's no good um, supply chain set up to actually do that. Um, so I, I, yeah, I think there's wow. a number of issues I could keep going on, but those are sort of the major ones that I see in relation to health and and the sort of connection to agriculture. 
Terry, well, that's terrific. And thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to have links to your RSC site. And gee, maybe we can see if we can get some things happening between what's happening in the, in the art on the land and us in the city, closer connections. Thank you so much for today. Thank you, Ron. It's been a pleasure. It's so interesting to talk with Terry. We did an episode with the legendary Alan Savory last year. Go back and have a listen to it. Uh, but Terry did mention him as an influencer, and he's done that for many people globally. In that show, Alan said, it's not the resources, and he was referring to, say, fossil fuels or animal agriculture that's the problem. It's the way a resource is managed that counts. And he added, to always be making decisions within a holistic context. How will what you do affect the long-term health of the individual and the planet? As we know, the two are interconnected. I love Terry's line, focus on what you want, not what you don't want. That's why focusing on your health is such a good plan. What about his point? This blew me away. Ruminants urine contains plant growth hormone. Amazing. I hadn't heard that before. And also... It promotes microbes in the soil that float up into the air and actually seed rain. Now, just to clarify, because I was, I was blown away by this and I had to ask Terry to make sure that I'd got the organism he referred to correctly. And he did actually mention Streptococcus, but he corrected himself. It's Pseudomonas syringi. Pseudomonas syringi. Also absolutely amazing. So until next time, this is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Be well. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health and related subjects. The content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical practitioner. Guests who speak in this podcast express their own opinions, experiences and conclusions.